For years, the NRA has touted itself as a staunch defender of the Second Amendment. The gun rights organization has been a powerful political roadblock against gun reform across the country. But now a series of revelations have exposed a different side of the group, a cash cow for insiders. Reporting has revealed board members benefiting from lucrative contracts, while top executives spent lavishly on high-priced clothes and luxury travel. Meanwhile, millions spent on law firms and PR has left the group on shaky financial footing. All of this comes as New York Attorney General Letitia James zeroes in on the group with an investigation into its charitable status. So what is the NRA really? And how does a group that purports to be a nonprofit become so profitable for a select few? To help me sort out the details of this developing story is one of the key journalists behind much of the critical reporting. Mike Spees is an investigative reporter at The Trace. He is currently partnering with The New Yorker on a series covering the NRA finances. He also just won a New York Press Club Award for continuing coverage. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks so much for having me on, Taya. Now, from my understanding, the NRA is a nonprofit organization. However, there seem to have been people who have been able to make a great deal of personal profit from it. Also, the NRA is running at a deficit of around $40 million each year. Can you explain that paradox? Well, uh, it seems you've gone right to the key question, haven't you? <laughs> um, there isn't really, I mean, there, there's no good explanation for this sort of behavior. So the, as a nonprofit, the NRA is a longtime tax subsidized organization. Uh, its chief function is supposed to be social welfare and also education, safety and training promotion. Uh, it is absolutely not, as any nonprofit is not supposed to, uh, it is not supposed to serve as a pass-through entity or a vehicle for self-enrichment. And much of what uh, I've discovered over the last bunch of months and also what has come out since then uh, through leaked documents on the internet elsewhere uh, is that a very small group of senior officials, management, folks close to them, vendors close to them have made hundreds of millions of dollars off of this nonprofit over a, a period of, of decades. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Now, now, the first inkling we had of the conflict inside the NRA was between Oliver North and Wayne LaPierre over money. Can you explain some of the revelations that came from your reporting and what came out during that dispute? Uh, yeah, I guess in, in, in some way, the, the first story I did came out in mid-April and it kind of anticipated that dispute. There had been an ongoing issue between Mr. North, who was appointed uh, president of the NRA's board, and, and Wayne LaPierre, and uh, the legal, or the law firm rather, that the organization has been using to fight like it's 20 million legal battles right now, uh, none of which seem to actually have any real purpose other than to just, uh, well, it's not clear what their purpose is, honestly. Um, so the dispute which burst out into public display at the NRA's annual meeting had to do, at, at least according to what we know, with Oliver North demanding that Wayne LaPierre resign. Uh, he and some others were very disturbed by some of the documents that were revealed in my initial report, which touched on, or rather delved into, deeply into uh, a, a culture of self-dealing that had been going on for a very long time. Um, and Wayne LaPierre, as the head of the organization since the 1991, was very much a part of that. It seemed to be very connected to it uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, but what wound up happening ultimately was Oliver North, when he when, when he pushed to to have Wayne resign, Wayne sort of preempted him by going public with Mr. North's, uh, I guess you could call it his letter, which which detailed a number of infractions, including some of the stuff that came out over the last month. You know, lavish European trips. Uh, expensive wow. suits, that kind of stuff. Um, and Wayne was, as he has before, was able to rally the board behind him and ultimately push Oliver North out and get him to resign. I mean, I think Oliver North, for its worth, this wasn't his, it wasn't his first scandal that he's been connected to. And <laughs> Very I, I true. <laughs> and, I, and I think for him, you know, he did have his own conflict of interest. He was getting paid by the NRA's top PR firm. That's really interesting. You also mentioned the PR firm that seems to be at the center of the controversy. I think it's Ackerman McQueen, and they're right. responsible for some really explosive videos. What are some of the allegations against this firm? Well, you know, 
it's it's an interesting this, this whole the way this story has morphed is sort of fascinating. Uh, Agra McQueen has long been controversial within the NRA, and uh, you know for a number of and, and grew up with Wayne Lapierre. I mean, really, I mean, in, you know, Wayne only strengthened that partnership, which brought that firm lots of money. Agra McQueen is ultimately been responsible for the, you know, it, the NRA's public face for decades. All the, the messaging, you know, NRA TV, ad campaigns, the stuff that like people are generally most familiar with, that stuff that was produced by Akron McQueen. And there was always this concern, um, understandably, that this for-profit firm had a lot of control within the organization, especially over Wayne LaPierre. Uh, and that, that all ultimately was true and that was that was sort of verified in documents I obtained but and this is an important but it's not as if it was just like it was doing this with a gun to the NRA's head you know and it, Wayne LaPierre had, had you know for what it seemed like it ultimately turned the keys over it was it was his choice it was senior management's choice to continue this relationship um, so for it now to sort of turn around and and act like it was sort of had like the, you know, had somehow for all these years had the wool pulled over its eyes or, or like that the, the firm was pulling one over on the NRA just doesn't really comport with reality. I was curious, one of the issues or reasons people say the NRA is in trouble is because donations are down since President Trump has been elected. But the NRA has what, maybe five, six million members. Can right. you explain this dynamic? Why is the NRA losing money now? Well, it was losing. I mean, this, mm -hmm. there's, this is this has always been the history of the NRA. It's just it's it it is an ebb and flow organization. It mm -hmm. flows when there's a Democratic president, and it ebbs when there's a Republican president. So there was it's oh just you know it's it's much easier to fundraise against an, a perceived antagonist than it is you know against a supporter. It's hard to rally people when you have someone who's in your corner. But when that you can sense. say like President Obama is going to take all of our guns away, you know whole. It's a whole different ballgame. Um, that said, while there was a steep drop off after Trump was elected, uh, and this is was fairly disturbing, uh, what I'm about to say, there, there was a, then a steep incline after Parkland that that enabled the new you know round of wow. fundraising. That is disturbing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's which also honestly is not an anomaly. I mean, every time there's a right. Made a mass shooting that that captures the public's attention. There seems there seems to be a, a fundraising rally that follows it. Um, as far as the NRA's money problems go, you know, revenue is one thing. The the main problem, which has been the main problem again for decades, is like just gross overspending, over borrowing, being overly leveraged. I mean, it wasn't as if like these money problems just started after Trump took office, they long predated his mm -hmm. tenure. They're saying things are better. It sounds like the NRA is hemorrhaging money. But you right. know, you mentioned a detail that was incredibly disturbing, that after the mass shootings of children, that the NRA not only pushes to do more fundraising, but actually succeeds. That's an, that's an incredibly disturbing detail. Um, I, I want to direct you towards the new New York Attorney General, Letitia James. She has started investigating the NRA's nonprofit status as it was founded in New York. What kind of impact do you think this Attorney General could have on the NRA? I mean, she's the, that office is, has the potential to have the most impact over mm -hmm. the organization. I mean, the, so the NRA uh, is chartered here, which means that it falls under the purview of the New York AG. And in that capacity, the AG can sanction board members, remove board members, dissolve the entire board, uh, petition to get executives or office or some other officers removed. It can also go to court to ultimately roll up the entire organization if it's, you know, if it's, if it's deemed too far gone, if the problems are too endemic that, that they can't be rectified. So, you know, it's it is it is a very bad thing for mm -hmm. for the organization that 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 the, that the New York AG is, has opened this investigation. And I and I suspect that um, quite a lot of resources are being put into carrying out this investigation because it's very high profile. 
Now, you mentioned NRA TV earlier and Dana Lash, and I've been watching a lot of NRA TV recently. There seems oh, to be, I know, there seems to be a lot of focus on illegal immigration, civil protests, and identity politics. So I'm quickly going to show a video clip that samples some of the NRA TV content. They use their movie stars and singers and comedy shows and award shows to repeat their narrative over and over again, all to make them march make them protest, make them scream racism and sexism and xenophobia and homophobia, to smash windows, burn cars, shut down interstates and airports, bully and terrorize the law abiding. The only way we stop this, the only way we save our country and our freedom is to fight this violence of lies with the clenched fist of truth. Thomas the Tank is now bringing gender balance to the show by adding girl trains. Seriously, one of those trains, Nia, will be from Kenya to add ethnic diversity to the show. They're trains. They don't even have skin pigmentation. Where Was there some concern that the show had racist undertones? I mean, I'm looking at this picture, and I'm really, really struggling to understand how in the world there isn't any diversity in any of this. Oh, was it because I see it? It was the white hoods and the burning train tracks. Okay, fine, fair point, fair, I get it. Thomas the Tank Engine has been a blight on race relations for far too long. Clearly, this is overdue. So, Mike, is there a connection here? What do you think their strategy is with this kind of messaging? And is there any conflict between the NRA and NRA TV? I, um, I think the strategy, again, is, is to place the NRA at the vanguard of the culture wars, which has mm -hmm. been Ackerman McQueen, was Ackerman McQueen's strategy from very early on. And it was, I mean, if you, if you remove your ideological leanings or, you know, your sense of decency from it, it was, it's been in many ways effective for them. I mean, oh, the absolutely. You know, it's the organization is obviously, you know, it, it's, it's very polarizing. You either... Yes revile it or you revere it. Um, but the narrative that's been put out uh, and in some places pushed forward by by certain media outlets that there was like that the issue was that there was some kind of internal discomfort between like the leadership and and what was appearing on NRA TV. Mm -hmm. I just just I, I mean that on it that just feels ridiculous to me. I mean, for, so you mentioned the, clen I mean, we're talking about the clench fist of truth ad. For example, I know because it came out in sworn affidavits that Wayne, I mean, Wayne LaPierre approved, literally approved of that wow. video, um, I believe. Wow. I, mean, I feel almost certain I have to, I mean, I mean, I feel 99% sure of that. Okay. I have to, I guess I have to double check. But, but the, the, the point is, is that there's no, it's not as if like the messaging just suddenly got like that. Right. You know what I mean? It, it's not like this is, it, if you're, I mean, you're trying to make a, a, a distinction between like, is that worse than what happened after Newtown mm. when, when Akron McQueen produced a video that uh, attacked President Obama's children for having secret security? Oh, that's or a secret good service. point. Good it's, point. The messaging has always, always been like this. I mean, it's getting more attention now because I think Dana, you know, it, over the, especially post-Trump, which is just, a, you know, the whole context has changed. Right. And Dana Lash in particular uh, is sort of just like a lightning rod yes. for, for attention. Queen. As just, if they just discovered what right. Ackerman McQueen was doing, as if they didn't know this whole time. Right. As, yeah. if, as if they were worried, right, as if they'd somehow been blindfolded and someone ripped off the blindfold. It just, it's kind of, uh, it's, I, I don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm not in the position as a journalist to defend anybody, but it is it is very much like the, the, the firm is now being scapegoated. And it's not as if, again, yes. it didn't engage in its own. It's not as if there weren't plenty of issues there. There were, but it was, it was um, representative of the NRA's institutional problems. It wasn't like as if like this was like this isolated thing and they just are right. chopping it off now.
So if you don't mind, I would also like to touch on the culture of the NRA and its defense of good guys with guns. It seems they don't promote, support, or defend black people who assert their right to bear arms like Philandro Castillo. He was right. a legal gun owner and had a permit to carry. And although he did exactly what the NRA says to do, which is to inform an officer that you have a gun and have the right to legally carry it, he was shot anyway. And the proof of this is on video. And there also was no defense of the black army vet Mantic Bradford Jr., who also had a carry permit. He was literally a good guy with a gun and ran to people's aid during a shooting in a mall in Alabama last year. He went to defend people, and he himself was shot by police in the process. So do you have any theories as to why this organization does not seem to publicly support the, black, the right of black people to legally bear arms? Well. I know that's a tough question to throw at you, but I really like your thoughts on it. No, I mean, it's a great, it's an important question, and it's a great question. Um, again, I'm only in a position to provide informed speculation, okay. and I suppose I have to be, you know, a little careful about what I say, but what I can tell you, which is maybe fairly obvious, is that the NRA is a profoundly white yes. organization. I mean, if you've ever been, they don't release information on the, on its, you know, on its membership demographics but if you've ever been to an annual meeting it is I, you know I don't like 99% white I mean if you actually they do provide statistics about the demographics of who attends the annual meeting which is usually like 90,000 people so assume that's a representative sample mm -hmm. um, I you know the vast 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 majority of those folks are white right. um, and that's there. So they are there. The organization is and where its power is. Power maybe is actually the wrong word because that gives it more that plays into the myth. But where its influence lies or where its membership base lies are in, you know, outstate rural communities, mm -hmm. sometimes the suburbs, but but profoundly white areas. Right. They've got no. I mean, maybe except for some very minor exceptions. You know, it's interesting because the NRA TV and Dana Lash in particular excoriate what they consider mainstream media. It'll be interesting to see if your reporting and investigations like that actually impact how your everyday NRA member views the board and how they look at how their money and donations are being spent. It'll be interesting to see if that has any impact on their membership roles. Well, it should. I mean, look, uh, as I, you know, again, as I've reported, the NRA is, is, is not very good at cultivating single big donors. Right. So the vast, vast majority of its revenue is coming from its, you know, five, 5.5, 6 million members. So the money that whatever, you know, the, I, I would imagine that at some point there would be some kind of outrage on their behalf since, you know, the, the, they're subsidizing the organization and the money that they're giving to the NRA is going in places that they right. would probably not want it to. Right. So, Mike, I just want to thank you for your in-depth investigation and for your time today. Thank you so much, Mike. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. My name is Taya Graham, and I want to thank you for joining me at The Real News Network.